Is the coelacanth still considered a living fossil? Living fossils represent presently existing organisms that are also found virtually unchanged as fossils in the geologic record. Some examples are the ginkgo, the sequoia, horsetails, the lingula brachiopod, nautilus, the horseshoe crab, tuatara lizard, and of course the coelacanth. Recently, however, a number of scientists have sought to remove the term living fossil from the paleontological vernacular by appealing to the philosophical underpinnings of evolution itself. Since all biological systems continually evolve, then all organisms removed from ancient ancestors by millions of years cannot possibly be close living descendants of those organisms, even if the descendants bear some morphological affinities to the ancestors. In this paper, for example, the authors proceed to apply this reasoning to the coelacanth, perhaps the most iconic of all living fossils. So let's dive in and take a look what all the fuss is about. Today, the coelacanth group is made up of just a single genus, Latimeria, which contains two known species. Comparing this modern genus to the supposedly 400 million year old Diplosocetes, and it doesn't take long for one to be convinced of their striking similarity, and why the term living fossil was aptly applied to the living Latimeria. And of course, one can also see why creationists are so interested in this subject. After all, according to standard evolutionary theory, Genetic mutations combined with natural selection and genetic drift are constantly at work, changing the genome so that new adaptations and thus new organisms are always evolving. Of course, evolutionists are not without answers, and several hypotheses have been put forward to explain this remarkable stasis. Some have proposed the work of stabilizing selection. This mechanism weeds out the traits of a population that are at one extreme or the other, thus leaving selection to favor those traits representative of the overall average. A popular example is the average weight of human babies. This average remains constant through time because premature babies, which are small, can struggle to survive while large babies have problems getting through the birth canal. Traits for these two extremes therefore tend to get removed from the overall human population, or at least they did just a few hundred years ago before the advent of modern medicine. This mechanism, however, only works in very stable environments where external pressures are minimized. Yet since the time of Diplosocetes, there have supposedly been five colossal mass extinction events with one of them wiping out 95% of all animal taxa alive at that time. On several occasions, huge volcanic eruptions produced thick and extensive sequences of flood basalts, which covered massive tracts of land and even ocean floor with millions of square kilometers of basalt that simultaneously released trillions of tons of sulfur and carbon dioxide, along with many other harmful gases directly into Earth's oceans. We are also told that the Earth has experienced multiple bolide impacts, with the one occurring at the end of the Cretaceous supposedly killing all of the dinosaurs. There is also the collision of Gondwana and Laurentia during the late Paleozoic, with the subsequent breakup of Pangaea during the mid to late Mesozoic, not to mention the copious swings in climate, oscillating from one extreme to the other over hundreds of millions of years. So stabilizing selection, that solution, it just isn't going to fly. Low species diversity has also been hypothesized. Stephen Jay Gould, for example, said they, speaking of living fossils, simply represent the few higher taxa of life's history that have persisted for a long time at consistently low species number and have therefore never experienced substantial opportunity for extensive change in modal morphology because species provide the raw material for change at this level and these groups have never contained many species. In other words, low numbers of species mean low numbers of mutations, which thus means low numbers of useful traits that natural selection can then act upon to build new organisms. There are, however, a number of problems with this hypothesis as well, the most salient of which is the problem of extinction. 
If a genus has low species diversity, then that genus as a taxonomic group is more prone to getting wiped out in an ever-changing and competitive environment. Given Gould's assessment, how in the world could this little subset of fish spend 400 million years dodging multiple mass extinctions, devastating volcanic eruptions, earth-shattering bolide impacts, and at least two ice ages? And if that isn't enough, this little coterie of rather harmless fish somehow avoided being eaten into extinction by an ever-escalating biological arms race that supposedly furnished every other animal in the ocean with more evolved, elaborate, and highly advanced weapons of predatory warfare. As it turns out, and according to this paper published in 2018 and this one in 2021, coelacanths may have been more diverse than previously thought anyway. So we can also discard this hypothesis as well. More recently, researchers concluded that the similarity of form between Devonian coelacanths and the modern Latimeria was due to an extremely slow rate of genomic evolution. In other words, coelacanths just didn't evolve very much. Cassain and Lorenti in 2013, however, point out the difficulties associated with such a hypothesis. Genomes change continuously under the combined effects of various mutational processes that produce new variants and genetic drift and selection that eliminates or fixes them in populations. In other terms, the only possibility for genomes to replicate without change implies at least one of the two following conditions. One, new variants do not appear, i.e. no mutations, and two, Two, new variants are systematically eliminated by selection. In other words, how can a genome remain virtually unaffected by mutations for a period of over 400 million years? Notice that in each one of these solutions, the scientists are appealing to mechanisms that somehow slowed down the rate of evolution by huge orders of magnitude. And it's important for creationists to detect the problem here and it's not evolution. The fact is that natural selection, well, it's a scientific surety, and vast amounts of diversity have certainly occurred since the flood of Noah. In fact, even in the secular realm, more and more scientific research is showing that species are diversifying at astonishingly rapid rates. Living fossils, therefore, do not necessarily challenge evolutionary assumptions. If the Devonian Diplosocetes went extinct 100,000 years ago, we wouldn't be having this conversation. And that's because there's enough wiggle room in the rates of evolutionary change to allow for stasis over shorter periods of time. Secular scientists, however, believe Diplosocetes went extinct 400 million years ago, and for obvious reasons, that presents a problem, and a huge one at that. There is simply no known mechanism that can adequately explain 400 million years of evolutionary stasis in very complex organisms. The issue then for the evolutionist is time and not the absence of evolutionary change, the typical refutation offered by creationists. The existence of not just one, but of over 600 living genera that supposedly have 70 to 500 million year old fossilized ancestors is in my opinion one of the most powerful indicators that those ancestors didn't actually live 70 to 500 million years ago but lived just thousands of years ago instead. And this I believe is where creationists should be focusing their attention. And this brings us to the fourth and final solution. Well, perhaps coelacanths are not living fossils after all. Those who champion this view assume that since Darwinian evolution is true, and since 400 million years of time have actually passed, then coelacanths must have undergone a huge amount of evolution. This means that the present-day coelacanth cannot be closely related to the Devonian Diplosocetes, or in fact to any ancient coelacanth. As such, we need to stop calling it a living fossil, which of course leads us to my opening question at the beginning of the video. For a response to this recent claim, then please join me in part two. So that's all from me, Ken Colson here at Creation Unfolding. Look, if you were in any way uh, blessed by this video, then please go ahead and hit that like button. I really appreciate it. Go ahead and share the video with friends on your social media platform. And of course, subscribe and ring the bell for easier access to more videos 
as they arrive. Uh, I've got a donation button in the description as well as one on my channel. So if you feel so led, please go ahead and I'd really appreciate any kind of donation whatsoever. Uh, I've got a website, of course, www.creationunfolding.com for more resources. I go into more depth there, have more references, things like that. So please go to the website. Uh, I've got a book, of course, if you're interested as well. And as always, please, I ask for prayer. This is the most important thing that I need. If you could spend just a moment and pray for me right now, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you and goodbye.